Welcome to a podcast about wealth and life. We all know that our finances play a big part in how we live our lives. In this podcast, the advisors from Foster and Motley share insights and information about investment and financial planning topics and how they connect to your life. There are a lot of people who are sure they can tell you where the economy and the markets are headed, and they may cite their favorite key indicator or theory to support their predictions, and of course, they offer examples of their success. Well, I'm Patrice Sikora with Foster and Motley's Luke Hale and Ryan English to talk about the value of forecasting. Luke, why do we seem to insist on wanting to predict the future? One, it's fun. You know, you just... <laughs> Everybody wants to know what's going to happen tomorrow. If you go back in human history, you look at fortune tellers and soothsayers and palm readers, and you know everybody's trying to help you look around the corner. And most of that doesn't work. There have been times, I think, in human history where it has been valuable. If you think about the caveman as he sits in his cave and and the lion walks by at two o'clock every day, you know he knows that maybe he shouldn't go outside at two o'clock because he may get eaten. So in those cases, it's been valuable, but the stock market's a different animal. Uh, it's not as valuable. And we've, we've looked at some very smart work of some very smart people, and we just don't think you can do it. So, but it's, but it's just human nature to try. And you mentioned stock market. What's the difference between economic forecasting and stock market forecasting? That's a good question. Economic forecasting tries to essentially accumulate all the data about a economy and how it's going to do. So is it going to do better tomorrow than it did today, or is it going to do worse tomorrow than it did today? And then the stock uh, is an investment in an individual company. And then the stock market market, as you put it all together, essentially is a forecast on economic data because businesses, the stocks themselves, perform within the broader economy. So which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Economic forecasting seems to be most popular, and then people try to try to back into the stock market aspect of it. Wouldn't you agree with that, Ryan? Yeah, I would. I would agree. I mean, there's, I guess, there's two different camps. Uh, you know, some people want to predict solely the stock market. Others believe that if you get the economics right or those variables correct, then that will lead to superior performance in the stock market. And I'll just add on Luke's point. I mean, we don't believe in in forecasting, but certainly, if someone could do it accurately, it would be very financial re rewarding. Mm -hmm but it's just extremely difficult. Well, I, you know, I, I do often hear people say that the market leads the way. The market knows what the economy is doing, even if we don't. Do you see this? Yeah, I mean, usually the market, you know, say if there's a recession on the horizon, the market will lead in terms of a decline. Maybe the rule of thumb is six months ahead of a recession that the stock market will start its decline and anticipate the future. So. The collective thoughts of others that are reflected in the stock market does have some accuracy from that standpoint. The difficulty is, of course, gauging what those thoughts are and anticipating what they will be. And Patrice, if you look at you know economic growth versus stock market performance, you could just look over the last, say, 10 or 15 years. I mean – Emerging market countries like Brazil, India, China, I mean, they've had, you know, great economic growth, but that, that has not necessarily translated into superior relative stock performance versus, say, the U.S. Uh, S&P 500. There were some other points though, that you wanted to bring out here, Ryan, right? Yeah, and, and Patrice, I would just say, you know, in this podcast, Luke and I are going to talk about, for one, does forecasting work? We're going to look at some historical predictions that forecasters have made and the accuracy of those forecasts you know we're, we're going to get Warren we're going to give you Warren Buffett's thoughts on on forecasting mm -hmm. and then uh you know kind of conclude with one of the most famous economists in history John Maynard Keynes and how his investment philosophy evolved from economic forecasting to individual uh stock picking i find his story very interesting as for the oracle Anything he says, we listen to, right? Exactly. All right. So kick it off. What's your first point here? 
So Patrice, when you look at um, stock market or economic forecasting, I guess we'll, we'll focus on stock market forecasting. There was an article written by Fred Hickey. He wrote this article in the New York Times and was highlighting the accuracy of stock market forecasting going back to the year 2000. And so for every year since 2000, he compared the annual Wall Street consensus forecast in late December with the actual level of the stock market of the S&P 500 one year later. And he found that over the years, the median forecast was that the stock market would rise by 9.8% in the next calendar year. Hmm. And when you look at over this time period, what did stock market actually do? Well, it rose by 5.5% on an annualized basis. So that's a very large difference between what the forecasters predicted and the actual outcome, or you could say that's an error rate of about 45%. So the median forecast was that stock would rise every year for the last 20 years in this scenario, and six years they actually fell. So the consensus was wrong in a number of periods, about 30% of the time, the direction of the stock market was forecasted inaccurately. And so you look at, you know, the big year in this kind of sample, and that was 2008. And that's when the stock market of the S&P 500 fell by about 38.5%. Well, back in December of 2007, this particular group was calling for an 11.1% rise in the stock market for 2008. So they were wrong. They were wrong by a very, very large amount. You know, you could say that it was a, about a 49.5 percentage point difference. Yeah. And the actual performance versus uh, what they had projected. But we know that the market will go eventually go down. Uh, I don't see how the median forecast could have been to rise every year. It's well, it may not know. pay. You know, it may not pay to to, uh, to forecast declines. <laughs> <laughs> People want. <laughs> I think along that that same thought train, the forecast make great TV and great media so it's always in your benefit to some extent to forecast because it's entertaining it's just not right most of the time you'd be better off flipping a coin and then there's plenty of examples of companies if you look at the individual company level of you know an er an er earnings announcement so and so xyz company you know slightly exceeds the revenue or the earnings forecasted expectations and then the stock goes down and you know that it's it's a it's not only difficult to get the underlying economics correct or the sales and earnings forecast correct but then you have, also have to understand what the market's expectations are and they may not necessarily be what the consensus expectation so it's kind of two variables that you need to know you need to know the actual numbers and then you know need to know sort of this second order effect of what is already priced in or or thought of in the market for that particular company. And you've also got to think about the psyche of the investor too. I mean, they may be, they may have shorted the stock. Right. I mean, every, you think about, you think about the stock market, there's a, there's a seller for each buyer and a buyer for each seller. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a it's sort of a hodgepodge of opinions about, you know, somebody that sells the stock obviously doesn't think it's going up and somebody that buys it does. <laughs> uh, so that's that's essentially what makes a market, right? And you have a bunch of collective thoughts that uh, attempt to price things or, or search for price discovery. Now, before we get on to Mr. Buffett, you've got a couple of phrases in here that I really want you to talk about because I, I love them. You've got perma bull and perma bear. <laughs> Tell me about those. Those are fun. Uh a perma bull is somebody that never thinks the stock market's going down. It's only going up. Things are only, the glass is only half full ever. It's interesting to watch these folks as they get into their forecasting and predictions. The stock market would tell you based on its history, it goes up more than it goes down. Mm -hmm. So it's actually pretty smart to be in the camp of an optimist if you're a stock market investor, but the perma bull never sees a bad economic result on the horizon. Now, the flip of that is the perma bear. So uh, stock market history would tell us he or she is not right as often, but um, 
research also tells us that it hurts the uh, individual investor a lot more when the stock market goes down than it feels good when the stock market goes up. So when a PERMA bear is right, he tends to get a lot of attention. Mm. So you just keep saying the sky is falling. And one of these days, the sky actually falls. And then that person ends up on TV and is relatively famous for the next three or four years because they called it. The problem was they've been calling it for years and years and years, and you missed out on a lot of money that you could have made. But uh, in that one period of time, they were successful and became relatively famous at, for their predictions. For one brief shining moment. That's right. Spotlight. But it's got to be awfully stressful to be a perma bear. Some people seem to enjoy that. I think we've all known people that are glass half empty kinds of people. They're not particularly fun to be around. They tend to be uh, know-it-alls. So I, I don't know that the perma bear has many friends, but they are are an interesting stock market forecaster. All right. Talk to me about Warren Buffett. Who wants to take this one? Yeah, Patrice, uh, Warren Buffett has never been considered a perma bull, but you could say that he is quite an optimist, especially when it comes to American business. And so, you know, he likes to use the example, if you were to look back to say, you know, the year 1900, and you you knew exactly what was going to happen. You knew that we were going to endure two world wars, several banking crises, a Great Depression, several other wars, the resignation of a president, another great financial crisis. And if you could have foreseen all of that, you may have thought, well, that's not going to be good for the stock market. I don't know if I want to invest based on what I foresee. But that that obviously was the wrong conclusion. You know, even though there's been a number of bad things that have occurred, the resilience of the American economy and the American business and and, and of course the stock market has been very, very strong and the right decision, you know, was to be an optimist. And he really thinks about economic forecasting as something that's not very valuable. I mean, he has a, a famous quote that that he has said, uh, you know, if a company has one economist employed, they have one employee too many. So <laughs> if that doesn't sum up his thoughts on whether or not you can predict business cycles, I think uh, I'm not sure what does. <laughs> that's fantastic. What is it? Uh, he really liked the railroads though, correct? He's really into railroads and all right. So what about Mr. Keynes here, the Keynesian theories? Yeah, so John Maynard Keynes was is obviously the famous economist that a lot of economic policy is is based on. And you know, his theories were that the government needs to stimulate the economy through, you know, fiscal spending or running sort of budget deficits when times are are tough. And obviously we as a country have employed that from time to time. So what is really not known about John Maynard Keynes is that he was also an investor and ran investment funds, say for the King's College over in London. And he originally, his investment philosophy was based on his economic forecasting since he, you know, that's what he knew so well. And so he attempted to make purchases and sales based on business cycles or what he did in sort of in, in his economic forecasting and his predictions. But what he had found that that did not, that top-down approach did not work. Hmm. And ultimately, he switched over to a value investing approach in buying companies that he felt were cheap relative to other companies or the benchmark. And you know, I don't have his exact track record, but his performance is alleged to be pretty uh, substantial in terms of the relative performance versus the benchmark based on this approach. So even he did not think that you could apply economic forecasting to stock market investing. Very interesting. And yet he is quoted by so many people now. I, I just love that story because who could have had more ability, at least in his time, to accumulate information and make thoughtful forecasts? I don't think anybody could. And he, to his credit, changed the way that he approached investing because what he thought didn't work. And he was at the the center of, of 
of the forecasting world. Hmm. Well, this brings us to Foster and Motley. What do you think about forecasting? What is your approach? Yeah, and I'm sure as most of our clients already know, we fall you know, more towards the John Maynard Keynes camp where we are not making investment decisions based on any sort of economic or business forecast that um, we will come up with or, you know, making different allocations across asset classes or sectors based on any forecast that we have. So we employ a value quantitative approach where we're trying to find businesses or companies that are trading for cheaper relative to a broader benchmark like the S&P 500. So basically, if you're in it for the long term? Yeah, Patrice, we choose to keep our investment approach simple. Because when you think about forecasting and the number of decisions that you have to consistently make, you're going to make mistakes in those decisions. You're going to have some sort of error, right? So the less decisions you have to make from that standpoint, the better. I mean, so that's how, you know, that's why we choose to keep it simple or a little bit simpler from our investment approach. All right, gentlemen, how can someone reach you if they want to discuss this further? And they can just give us a call at 513-561-6640 or check out our website. I think there's some really good information that lets you know how our investment strategy works and how we tend to help people. And that's www.fosterandmotley.com. Well, gentlemen, I predict listeners who want to learn more about any number of life and financial topics will follow and share this Foster and Motley podcast. Listeners, don't miss out. Be one of those people. And thanks for being with us. Thank you for listening to Foster and Motley, a podcast about wealth and life. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information discussed and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Foster and Motley. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. Keep in mind that rules and regulations are subject to change. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions regarding your financial planning and investments. Foster & Motley is not affiliated with any third-party providers. Any mention of a third-party provider does not imply an endorsement of that provider. If you decide to utilize a third-party provider, you do so at your own risk.